So we've seen that magnetic field strength can be described in terms of flux density. It can also be described in terms of force. And this time, this is very similar to how we describe electric field strength and gravitational field strength. For example, in um, magnetic field strength B, we can say is the force per unit something, just like we say that uh, gravitational field strength G is the force per unit mass, which uh, you'll recognise for F equals mg, even though um, gravitational fields comes up in, top, in the next section. But, also, but electric field strength we know is force per unit charge. So field strength is always the force per unit something. Well, magnetic field strength is a bit weird. It's force, or one way of expressing it, is force per current length. In other words, length of conductor L carrying a current I. And there's a, and there's a few more peculiarities about the magnetic field as well, which we'll come back to. But anyway, it's good to see that there's that kind of analogy between the types of field. Well, let's just see kind of how that force might arise. First of all, let's look at um, the magnetic field created in, a, in, a, in a, just a wire carrying a current. We've already looked at the coil, but it's worth noting that, you know, if a current is moving along through one, just one long straight wire, well, the field um, has a particular appearance. So you can imagine there's this wire is poked up through the middle of a piece of card in the horizontal plane so that we could sort of imagine the field on that. And we, I mean, we could find out what the field looked like by putting some little plotting compasses around here and then switching on the current. And anyway, what we would find is that the needles would all point around in a circle, interestingly. So it turns out that the field, remember magnetic field is always in closed loops, goes in a, in a circular manner around a long straight wire. And the circles get further and further apart as, as you go out. So, so look, let's do a little one in the middle. Uh, now, of course, we have to have a direction of the field. And remember, this time it really does show that there's no kind of north or south. It's just a, there's just direction. Well, the way to determine the direction, there's a kind of convention. And you can use something called the, the right-hand rule. The right, it's, a, it's not the right-hand rule we looked at, the grip rule. This is the cork, it's called the corkscrew rule often. And it just shows us um, exactly which way the surface will go. If you point your thumb, if you grab the wire, your thumb points in the direction of the current, then your fingers show you the direction of the magnetic field line. So in this case, they would be going anti-clockwise around the wire here. So why is that important? Well, it's important because magnetic fields interact with each other. Let's look at an example. So for example, if we kind of got ourselves a uniform magnetic field, um, it might look like this. So this, we might use a horseshoe magnet, a big, um, or two magnets, one with its north pole facing the south pole of another to get this nice region of uniform magnetic field there. So let's imagine now we've got a current carrying conductor with it. So it's current going through it heading into the screen. In other words, we're kind of going to be looking like we're looking up the, along the end of this wire here. The current's going away from us, but we're just looking in that direction. So that, so in this depiction, the current's disappearing into the screen. That's sometimes drawn, by the way, as a cross um, in many textbooks and things, like showing that the current's going into the screen, like the tail feathers of a dart moving away from us. Well, um, I'm gonna, we know that the field is going to look kind of like circles around there. So I'm going to draw a few circles around. And just while I do that, see if you can decide the direction of the arrows would be on um, in this example. So I'm just going to do three circles. They have to get further and further apart. Uh, so use your corkscrew, the corkscrew rule. And they're not very spherical, never mind. Right, there we are. Well, you should have decided that the circles are going clockwise this time because of the corkscrew rule. Okay, brilliant. Well, now, now let's imagine that we put this little current carrying conductor inside the, the uniform magnetic field over here. Right, well, suddenly um, we can see that 
the two magnetic fields are going to have to sort of interact with each other. If we sort of put some more arrows on, clockwise arrows, we can see that above the wire, the two fields kind of add together, whereas underneath the wire, you can see that the fields are going to kind of subtract from each other. Well, the fields can only have one strength in one position. So th there's a kind of net outcome of that. And we end up with field lines which look something like, I mean, these add like as vectors. So it's got, they're going to add together, it's going to be a very strong field at the top. But it turns out that you get this kind of, um, therefore, closer field lines at the top. And they sort of, and you get this kind of combination of the circles with the straight lines. And you get something that looks a bit like that. Whereas underneath, we just get a very sort of weak field. So I'm only going to do one line, because remember the spacing of the lines indicates the strength of the field. And we have to put our arrows, so our arrows will be going like something like this. Well, um, it's quite a nice visual example, because um, you can imagine that the field lines are acting like a kind of catapult. And that is actually what happens, the, the wire feels a force, and it feels a force directly down in this example. Quite, quite strange. And uh, so it just will, f and the wire, if you actually did this experiment with a current going through that wire, then the wire would indeed just fly down out of that magnetic field region. So the fields interact together and cause an effect. Well, this is called, this actually has a name, this is the force. This is called the, the motor effect, otherwise known or, it's the motor or catapult effect. And, um, very, very important effect in physics because um, obviously the electric motor is a massively important uh, device in the, in the modern day. So that's the motor effect or the catapult effect. Okay, and well, it's not obvious, I just should add, I mean, it's not, even though it looks satisfyingly kind of making sense that that should happen, that you should get this kind of downward force, it's actually not obvious why the wire, what, why that should happen, um, but it just turns out it must be to do with the interaction of the charges that are creating these fields. So I'll just make that note. It's true. This is an interesting thing to be aware of. Magnetic field lines they tend to contract longitudinally and expand laterally. So in other words, what that means is that if you squash together a bunch of field lines like this, they tend to want to sort of expand apart and and if you have a sort of stretched out one, they tend to want to be as short as possible. So that's what it means, contract longitudinally. So you can sort of see that the effect that those are going to have, and, and the wire is going to feel a force, and it's going to fly down. So that's what's going on. OK, so we need to clarify what's going on here, because we've got here, we've put a current carrying conductor inside a magnetic field, a uniform magnetic field, and it's experiencing a force. Well, we defined this new way of expressing magnetic field strength, B, uh, as, as below, F as here, B equals F, divided by current length, the force per unit current length. So that means that this expression is really referring to the original field that we put the wire in. Okay, so it's not the field of the, that's produced by the wire, and it's not the magnetic field, the kind of combination of the two. But it's the fear, it's, it's a way of describing the strength of the field in which we put the wire. Because the wire creates its own field which interacts with that field, and the effect on the wire, the force, is just going to depend on um, how much current there is in the wire and what the length is. So if a B field is very strong, then the same current and the same going through the same length of conductor would have a, it would experience a bigger force. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. Well, um, we notice a couple of things here then. So let's kind of write that down so we can say, OK, the field strength of the permanent magnetic field is uh, given by the force acting on a wire per unit current per unit length when placed in the field. Uh, well, we also ought to just note the units again here, because remember that we've already decided that B is measured in Tesla's when we uh, when we defined it in the last section. Uh, but we can see here that a Tesla, therefore, is also a Newton per amp per metre.
So that's also true. Well, we can write this equation another way around as well. We can write F equals BIL, which is quite well known because it's like easy to remember. F equals Bill. Uh, so the magnetic field strength times the current time in the field in the wire times the length of the wire in the field. Okay, but it's really important to remember something that I haven't yet mentioned, and that's this fact. This equation, in fact, well, but in both arrangements, is only true when um, the current current conductor is perpendicular to the field. If you look in this example here, the field is going left to right and the current current conductor is going straight into the screen. Um, or I, I could have it coming up this way, that would still be perpendicular and would still work. But, um, but if, if not, then the situation has changed. And a bit like with the flux situation in the last section, we need to modify our equation to be able to deal with that. So let's get a nice big permanent magnetic field here. And let's look at a few situ different situations which will enable us to kind of create that modification. So first of all, I'm just going to draw a nice uh, current carrying conductor perpendicular. So this time we're going to have it going up the page. That's still perpendicular to the field. I hope you agree. And so I'm going to have a current going through that wire there. And well, the amount of length, of course, in this case, I'm, I could label as well, is actually um, I mean, I've just done it exactly to match the size of the field, not that, not that it has to. Um, so that's the amount of length of conductor in the field. Now, that is perpendicular. The angle between the current carrying conductor and the field is 90 degrees. Well, we can now look a bit like last time we can look with the flux, the area in the flux, the cross section area in, of, um, in a field of, of flux density. Well, we can imagine what would happen if I kind of just had up my current current conductor aligned along parallel to the field like this. Well, this time we've got the angle between the, the, the current current conductor and the field is zero. So I'm going to put theta equals zero. Here, theta equals 90. And then we ought to look at the general case again, where we kind of have at some kind of random angle theta. With a, again, with a current going through it and the same length. So there's my current I, that's current I. Let's put the lengths on just for good measure so that we can see what's going on. There's the length there, there's the length there. So it's always the same wire with the same current, yes? But um, the, we're just changing the relative angle between the wire and the field. So what we've got is um, three different situations. Well, this time we modify the equation not with a, um, and the angle theta is there, not with a cosine theta, but with a sine theta, and you'll see why. So we're going to write a new equation as uh, F equals B I L sine theta. And well, this works because, um, I mean, it's the, basically it's the component of length in the, per, that is perpendicular to the field. So if you're good with your maths, you can see that the component of length perpendicular field will be I sine, will be L sine theta. Um, but we can see that it works uh, because if theta is 90, well sine theta is 1, so um, let's write that over here. So when theta equals 90, F equals B I L, well that we know already from our initial idea. If theta equals 0, then F equals 0. So this is new. So if the, if the wire is parallel to the field, then there's no force, there's no interaction between the two magnetic fields, and there's, there's just no force exists. And if it's somewhere in between, then we get the general case, F equals B I L sine theta. So we've got an equation that gives us the size of the force, but of course what we haven't done in these, case, in these cases here is do all our sort of magnetic field lines and look at how they combine and the interaction to give us the direction of the force. Now, we could do that, uh, but there's a nice, neat rule which enables us to, to work out the direction that the wire of the force on the wire. And that's called Fleming's left-hand rule. So that's the last thing we're going to look at in this section. OK, so Fleming's left-hand rule might be something that you've come across before. It's sometimes just simply known as FLHR, Fleming's left-hand rule. And, um, well, here it is. 
Uh, so force field current. So I always remember that kind of force field is a kind of, you know, in science fiction, you have a force field. So that's the first two. So it goes force field current. Now, the thumb in this particular diagram, it looks a little bit at an angle, but we're really talking like that's perpendicular to the field, perpendicular, and then the current's kind of coming out of the page, if you like. Uh, so you need to get your, just like in the hand in the drawing, you need your thumb, your four, first finger and your second finger, all perpendicular to each other. And um, so obviously the current I can't draw in 3D, but that's coming out of the screen. That would be coming out of the screen in that orientation. And to just to apply it, well, you need to usually, you need to line up the field and the current and then just see where the force is. So have a go. I mean, here's um, our original example. Now we know the answer is that the force should be down. So let's check out that it works. So um, just have a go. So the field is going kind of left to right. So what you need to do there is line from north to south. So line up your first finger of your left hand with your left hand kind of with your fingers and thumbs like this. Line up the field, well, pretty much just as in the diagram. Your first finger needs to point left to right. But then, of course, the current here is going into the screen. So you're going to have to kind of rotate your hand around without moving the relative positions of your thumb and your fingers so that your first finger is pointing into the screen and that should leave your thumb pointing down. Okay, so if not, then you need to kind of figure out what's going on there. But you should end up with um, your thumb pointing down to show that the force is down. And we know that's what happened when we did, when we looked at the interactions of the field. Uh, let's have another example. Well, in this case, uh, well, see if you can figure out, you want to pause and see if you can figure out the direction of the, of the force on this current carrying wire. Well, again, the field is left to right again, so you don't have to change that. But this time, the current has to be just pointing down the page, not into the screen, but down. And you should find that your force is pointing out of the screen. So hopefully, um, that's what happened. Okay, um, out of screen there. And one last example might be good. Let's imagine a region of field which is going into the screen. So this is B into screen. And just this time we'd imagine a current perhaps traveling along from left to right, just to make it a little bit different. Well, pause, see if you can figure out which way the force is this time. And, well, you should find this time that the force using left femoral left hand rule is upwards. And, um, and, well, if you got all of those right, then you're good to go with Fleming's left hand rule.